Turkey's military reach is quietly expanding. Since 2011, the Turkish armed forces have shifted their strategy from a domestic defensive military into an expeditionary one, with troops now permanently stationed in six different countries. So why is Turkey expanding their military footprint now? And how far do these actions extend? And in what way do these support or conflict with some of NATO's stated goals? They've been engaged in combat on their borders in Syria and Iraq, as well as thousands of kilometers away in Africa. And that number only has signs of increasing. So is it time to sound the alarmist alarm? Is the Ottoman Empire making a comeback? Or is Turkey just protecting their interests? Turkey's military interventions is a complicated, hotly debated topic that has many important aspects to it, which are gonna be outside the scope of this video, like some of the domestic political situation. My goal is to focus on the specific military actions that they're taking and the potential reasons for it. With 1 million active and combined paramilitary personnel, the Turkish Armed Forces is actually the second largest standing military force in all of NATO, right after the United States military. But it's not just boots on the ground. They're also conducting maritime security operations in the Mediterranean, Aegean Sea, off the coast of Somalia, and anti-piracy operations. These moves might be why some publications and international relations experts that are way above my pay grade are saying that Turkey's trying to recreate the Ottoman Empire. I didn't say it, they did. And that's why we're gonna interrogate that claim today. A good way to understand Turkey's actions is to look at their geography. They're located at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. Their nation serves as a bridge between the East and the West, connecting Islamic and Christian regions. But on the other hand, it also puts them in a potentially vulnerable security situation because Turkey is situated right in the middle of many of the wars raging today, including Syria, Armenia, Azerbaijan, the war in Ukraine rages just across the Black Sea from them, and the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, these are all just a few hundred kilometers from their borders. So, how they choose to react to this reality is going to come under close scrutiny. But before we dive into that, I picked up a really bad, terrible habit when I first deployed to Iraq, like a lot of soldiers did, I'm sure, and I use that as a bulletproof excuse to never quit. But Fume uses air to deliver all natural, delicious flavors. There's no vapor, no harmful chemicals, no electronics. It has an adjusted airflow dial, nice hefty weight to it, and it's designed with movable parts and magnets. They also just launched Base, which is a weighted stand to rest your Fume on when not in use. And since it's attached with a magnet, you can spin your fume around on it when your fingers feel that itch. I personally know how stopping is hard, but switching to fume is fast, easy, and can even be fun. Fume has served over 150,000 customers, and they have thousands of success stories. There's no reason you can't be one. Head to tryfume.com slash taskpurpose, or scan the QR code and use code taskpurpose to get 10% off when you get the journey pack today. That's tryfum.com and use code taskpurpose to save an additional 10% off your order today. Back to the episode. Turkey's built on a military legacy stretching back over 600 years through the Ottoman Empire. In 1680 AD, it spanned three continents, ruled the Islamic world and large sections of Europe. Their borders extended all the way from Kiev in the north down to Yemen in the south. The Council on Foreign Relations put it this way. Turkey was founded in 1923 from the remains of the Ottoman Empire. Turkey pursued a secular, Western-aligned foreign policy by joining NATO and seeking closer ties with the EU. Today, with a population of 84 million people and a fast rising GDP of $819 billion per year, they are clearly an ambitious nation. To support their military strategy, their defensive spending has been a roller coaster going up and down, reacting in part to the changing conditions in the region. But in 2024, they're set to increase defense spending by 150%. From Turkey's perspective, this increase will help support their military interventions in Libya, Syria, and elsewhere. So let's find out all the locations where Turkey's military is operating and what some of the reasons for their involvement might be. Take a look at the island of Cyprus. This is where Turkish forces have been over the last 50 years since they invaded in 1974. To make a really complex situation simple for my average infantryman brain, the invasion followed a coup d'etat by a Greek faction who sought union with Greece. This alarmed the Turkish minority and prompted Turkey to intervene militarily. As of 2024, there's about 40,000 Turkish troops currently in Cyprus, concentrated in northern Cyprus. To give you a bit of context, the US military currently has 28,000 troops stationed in all of South Korea. 
This is a ethnically Turkish breakaway nation on the island that's only recognized by Turkey. While the Republic of Cyprus in the south is a fully fledged EU member and not recognized by Turkey and instead supported by Greece. Turkey has claimed military responsibility over Cyprus since 1960 after the island gained independence from Britain. And it uses that legal responsibility and ethnic population to garner a strategic edge in the region. Historically speaking, these conflicts go back hundreds of years, where Ottoman Empire once ruled over Greece and the Balkans. Cyprus is important for Turkey for multiple reasons. Their main stated one is protection of the ethnically Turkish people, but other possible factors could include its shipping routes and energy resources. The lucrative maritime trade of the Mediterranean sees anywhere between 20 to 30 percent of all global shipping. The geographic location of the island nation means that any Middle Eastern nation looking to ship goods through the sea will do so in Turkish controlled waters, which is always good for business. Additionally, off the coast of Cyprus sits the Aphrodite natural gas field. In July of 2020, Turkey announced plans to conduct seismic testing near the Greek island of Kastarilio to identify potential drilling points. This island sits less than two miles from the southern coast of Turkey and the surrounding waters are economically disputed. Greece claimed that the testing and drilling would occur within their national territory, while Turkey claimed that the area belonged to them. Turkey activated its navy to escort the testing rigs, while Greece activated their navy to stop them. This peaked with Turkish and Greek warships facing off at a high alert status, but eventually both navies were pulled back after high-level talks. Turkey's military presence in northern Cyprus essentially serves as a bargaining chip with Greece, both expanding their territorial claims into the Mediterranean Sea over these natural gas sites and keeping the status quo with the Greek-backed Republic of Cyprus. While talks of cooperation between the two nations have actually increased since their military standoff, Turkish claims over territorial rights have become more active in both the Mediterranean and Aegean Sea. While the matter remains unresolved, it's very important to note that both Greece and Turkey have been in NATO since 1952, and the relationship between the two isn't entirely conflict and tension. They also cooperate with economic ties, just recently increasing their bilateral trade to $10 billion this year. In fact, they even signed a quote, declaration of friendship and good neighborliness in Athens on December 7th which is more than I've done with my neighbor Carl. I mean, I would if he wanted to, Carl's pretty cool. The recent international deployment of Turkish armed forces has been largely under the direction of the current Turkish president Erdogan, who served as prime minister from 2003 to 2014 and as president from 2014 to today. Prior to Erdogan's election as president, the Turkish armed forces had a history of playing a role in national politics. This is highlighted in the controversial failed coup attempt in 2016 that saw massive purges of military officers afterwards. However, since Erdogan's stay in office, increasing measures of civilian control over the armed forces have been introduced, closer to the Western models. The following reforms also professionalized the military, moving away from relying on conscripts and placing more emphasis on full-time personnel. This move away from conscripts was seen as crucial to increasing international deployments because conscripts are far from ideal in long-term cross-border activity. And to that point, this is the border region between Turkey and Iraq. There's recently been a bigger push by Turkey's president here. Part of the reason for this is because of the ethnic Kurdish population that's located here, with about 20 million residing in southwest Turkey and 6 to 8 million in northern Iraq. The Turkish interest in Iraq is largely centered around dissuading Kurdish separatists, namely the Kurdish Workers' Party, or the PKK, from breaking away from Turkey to form their own country. Conflict between Turkey and the PKK has been ongoing since 1978 and before, but has seen significant escalation since July 2015. These disputes have a deep history that can be traced back about as far back as you prefer. One place to start, though, is when the modern-day borders of the Middle East were carved up and drawn largely by Britain and France following the end of World War I. This was when the Ottoman Empire ended and their territory was divided, Iraq and Syria was split off in this process. To put it into polite, diplomatic terms, the situation is absolutely foobar. The Turkish ground forces have adopted what's called the inkblot strategy in northern Iraq, 
So the inkblot strategy is a military and political strategy that involves expanding your control and influence gradually, similar to how ink spreads on a paper. Oftentimes, you'll see this term used to describe counterinsurgency operations where your main goal is to expand control over a population. With over 100 military outposts scattered throughout here in order to maximize the effectiveness of the troop numbers and prevent the PKK Kurdish forces from organizing on a larger scale. This also allows them to keep tabs on broader Iraqi Kurdish activity. Because from Turkey's point of view, any independence movement in Iraq would almost instantly spread into Turkey. Starting in December 2023, dozens of Turkish troops were killed in attacks conducted by the PKK. President Erdogan then announced that operations against Kurdish militant groups would increase, saying, quote, our operations will continue until every inch of the mountains in northern Iraq that have become the source of terrorist actions are secured. Over the past few years, Iraq has increasingly voiced disapproval of Turkish strikes in the region, claiming they violate Iraq's own rights to self-defense. However, the two countries just brokered a massive agreement, which seeks to completely remove the PKK presence in the area while opening up the pathway for what's called, quote, the Development Road Project which would establish a 1,200-kilometer road and railway connecting Turkey to the Persian Gulf through Iraq. This would streamline trade with India away from the longer Saudi land routes and connect India to Europe quicker and cheaper. I'm trying my best to balance this out and include information not only on Turkey's military interventions, but also their diplomatic cooperation. And this is where things start to get politically messy. While the PKK in Northern Iraq have been labeled a terror group by many other NATO countries, including the United States, other Kurdish groups have aligned themselves with Western powers. The Kurdish People's Defense Unit, or YPG, inside of Syria is a Kurdish military that largely emerged as a result of the Syrian civil war. The group fought against both the Syrian government and later on the Islamic State. During the conflict, the United States aligned themselves with the YPG provided tactical aid and support against ISIS, and protection from the Syrian government. Turkey, a NATO ally of the United States, considers the Syrian YPG, like the Iraqi PKK, to be a Kurdish terrorist group, and has continuously conducted airstrikes against them in northern Syria. The reason I explain all of that is because of one of the major points of disagreements in international relations between Turkey and some of the Western powers. Syria represents by far Turkey's largest foreign operation. President Erdogan first deployed soldiers to the country to intervene in 2016 to fight both the Islamic State and the Kurdish fighters. A major goal of their efforts was to establish a buffer zone along the border in northern Syria as a means to encourage refugees to return home. Turkey has an inherent interest in expanding its military presence south to Iraq and Syria. From Turkey's point of view, the shared borders present a massive security liability if not kept in check. Additionally, these are both countries that the United States has a heavy hand in. If Turkey does not place themselves in an active role within either country, they lose political and military influence. Political and military influence often go hand in hand with economic influence, which has led to the North African country of Libya hosting a small population of military trainers and advisors from Turkey. Libya is still recovering from the toppling of its government in 2011 and the two civil wars that followed. The government of National Accord was the ruling party in Tripoli and the officially recognized government by the UN. However, several countries, including Russia, Egypt, UAE, supported the opposing Libyan National Army that sought to overthrow the GNA. Turkey had worked out billions of dollars worth of business deals with that sitting GNA government and had cooperated with them for lucrative energy rights inside the Mediterranean near disputed Greek waters. If the Libyan National Army were to take power, Turkey was likely to lose all of that. That's likely part of the reason why I think on January 2nd, 2020, the Turkish parliament approved an official intervention in Libya. The first assets on the ground were Turkey's version of the CIA called the MIT, or just simply the organization. According to Foreign Policy Research Institute, Turkey launched an operation whose primary tactical objective was to put an end to the then eight-month-long attack waged on the capital by the rebel commanders and their armed coalition. By late September 2020, the Turkish-backed forces had successfully forced the rebel main brigade out of northwestern Libya. 
Since then, Turkey's parliament received an extension on their army deployments into 2026, and Turkish cargo planes continue to fly new supplies into Libya. Tripoli in Libya was once one of the furthest west reaches of the Ottoman Empire before its collapse. President Erdogan argued that the extension was crucial to eliminate potential attacks against Turkey's interests and provide humanitarian aid to the Libyan people. Turkish support of the Libyan government has ranged from providing training and logistical support all the way to hiring Syrian mercenaries to fight alongside militia groups. One of the biggest ways that Turkey was able to tip the scale of the fighting in Libya was through its use of cutting-edge drone technology. Turkish drone technology has skyrocketed over the past decade. These drones have been the linchpin technology in several conflicts at this point, with over 30 countries now having these drones operational within their militaries. 2023 saw $4 billion in drone sales, but their use has brought political heat to the government. One of the regions shaped by these drone sales was the nation of Azerbaijan. During the 2020 battles between Armenia, Azerbaijan made heavy use of Turkish-bought TB2s. Azerbaijan had many other advantages in terms of their economic growth and defense spending, but it's also true that Armenia lacked any meaningful way to defeat these drones, and they suffered a resounding loss. Azerbaijan and Turkey secured a defensive pact in 2022, and they've had constant rotation of Turkish trainers, advisors in the country since. Turkey also gained access to an airbase there for extended air power into the Caucasus region. Similar to its goals in Libya, Turkey has an inherent economic interest in the area. Known as the Middle Corridor, Turkey is attempting to create a modern transportation route linking Europe to Central Asia and China via Turkey, the Caspian Sea, Black Sea, and the Caucasus. This would allow both China and Europe to bypass traditional routes through Russia or the Suez Canal. By having a heavy hand in Azerbaijan, Turkey can ensure that any future conflict between them and the Armenians would be so one-sided that it deters any potential fighting. A successful middle corridor would make Turkey an economic powerhouse and shift the balance of EU and NATO power closer to its own capital. The recent push for energy rights and shipping control has resulted in Turkey constructing a 5,000-person military base in the oil-rich country of Qatar. This was in direct opposition to Saudi Arabia, as Turkey seeks out energy security from Qatar while previously relying on Saudi Arabia. But this move against the Saudis is being balanced out by Turkish arms sales to the country. In 2017, Saudi Arabia, along with the UAE, Bahrain, and Egypt, enacted a total land, air, and sea blockade against Qatar for not adhering to regional policies. This partnership with Turkey gives Qatar a greater sense of autonomy from its neighbors and gives Turkey a leg up in the energy trade. The security agreement between Turkey and Qatar went into effect just two years ago in 2022 and allows Qatar to temporarily deploy warplanes to Turkey for joint drills. Additionally, Turkey can use Qatar cargo jets to aid with their air logistics. Though the 5,000-person Qatar base is impressive, as of 2017, Somalia is home to Turkey's largest overseas military installation. Located in Mogadishu, hundreds of Turkish troops regularly train Somali soldiers as part of a large-scale Turkish effort to rebuild the country after decades of conflict and civil wars. Turkey has been seeking to increase its footprint inside the Horn of Africa for the past decade and so far has helped reintroduce vital services like education, healthcare, and defense stability in the region. It comes as no surprise, however, that providing security to Somalia came with an agreement that Turkey has rights to exploration, exploitation, development, and production of oil on Somalia's onshore and offshore blocks. The establishment of offshore drilling in Somali waters also brings with it Turkey's legal right to police the waters in the Gulf of Aden, and all accompanying shipping routes. Ukraine has been a major user of Turkey's TB2 drone in their war against the Russians. However, Turkey is the only NATO member that has favorable relations with Russia. The Ukraine war, though, has forced Turkey between a rock and a hard place. Prior to the breakdown of the conflict, some signs were pointing to Turkey moving away from NATO allegiance and pivoting towards Russia after plans were set for Turkey to purchase Russia's S-400 SAMs and potentially the Su-57 stealth fighter. Additionally, because Turkey was heavily reliant on the Russian oil for their economy, 
they refused to impose sanctions after the invasion, while still providing lethal aid to Ukraine to fight the Russians. It, it's okay, I'm confused too. Ultimately, Turkish military expansion is driven by its desire for greater economic influence, specifically in areas of energy production and shipping lanes, while using its recent military sales as leverage to make more politically risky moves against the bigger players in the international arena. By taking advantage of opportunities in regions that have less international support, Turkey is attempting to work its own way into the great power competition, but at the cost of stepping on some toes along the way. But I want to know what you guys think of Turkey's growing ambitions. Let me know down in the comments section below. I'm your average infantryman, Chris Cappy, signing off. Yesterday, I saw my neighbor Carl wearing one of our lethality t-shirts, and he said it's absolutely changed his life. So go to the description and click the link for the merch store to get yours today.